Hello and welcome to another program here at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. On behalf of our board of directors, our executive director, Tracy Hyder Suffern, and our artistic staff of Christian McBride and Jonathan Batiste, we're excited to present another episode of Desert Island Discs, one of the longest running programs here at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. And to get things started, we will welcome our host and curator for Desert Island Discs, Mr. Ted Pankin. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and welcome, audience. Um, and as you can tell, or as you could tell from the, uh, from the uh, photograph before, our guest today is the, the pianist Chris Davis. Pianist, I should say, pianist, composer, and record label owner Chris Davis, who um, is, has been one of the most, who apart from her, creativity uh, and virtuosic execution is one of the most pr productive musicians on the scene. She has a label called Pyroclastic Records, which has some uh, 20 releases, including some of the strongest things in the last few years. She's also an educator. I'm amazed that she has time to do this, but, um, but, but, but here we are. Um, and welcome, welcome, Chris, and thank you for joining us on Desert Island Discs. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to dig into these recordings. Well, we're going to really be digging into the first track in a moment, um, which is something that probably any mu jazz musician who is listening to this show or any jazz fan, it's safe to say that there's one record uh, that um, everybody knows. It's the Miles Davis, My Funny Valentine album with George Coleman, Herbie Hancock. Ron Carter and Tony Williams. I've, I've never met anyone who doesn't know this record. And for you, Chris, as a young piano student, either in Vancouver or Calgary, because I don't know where you were when you, uh, or what stage you were at when you heard this, this was this and the, the Keith Jarrett trio recording live at the Deerhead, an ECM recording, where Keith Jarrett was, actually played with Paul Motion and, and Gary Peacock, very swinging record. Uh, were the were two records that your teacher gave you that kind of switched you into from a, a classical music into jazz. So before we hear uh, all of you, which is the track we'll hear from my funny Valentine, tell us, uh, 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 just give us the story leading up to that and then we'll proceed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my Funny Valentine, Four and More, that box set was the first record, um, jazz record I ever heard. And I was playing in the jazz band at school. Um, I guess it was middle school, so I was about 12, 13. And my band director, who's a um, big jazz fan um, and just a great all around educator and musician, um, you know, said we would hang out in the band room after school and just wanted to play music. and. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Zoom issues. <laughs> um, no, you're good. You're good. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, he we were hanging out, and he's like, "You should check out this record." And so I took it home, and I just I totally fell in love with it. I love Herbie Hancock's playing. I loved how Tony Williams and Herbie Hancock played together. I love the openness of the pieces and how they would jump right back into the form and there was a kind of freedom and structure at the same time and I didn't understand it all but I was just completely drawn to it and so I um, shortly after that sort of transcribing Herbie's solo on all of you which is what we'll hear um, and then just went on to transcribe all those solos <laughs> um, so that was my you know early early jazz education I think, in but you, were, you had been playing classical music from a fairly early age. And I think I wrote about Chris a few years ago, so I have some factoids about you, but um, you, you mentioned that um, you were got into the jazz band because you could play scales and read music and they needed a pianist who could do that. I think you said that, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And that you like jazz because playing classical music and practicing was a solitary activity. And you like the uh, social aspect of playing jazz. You can just say yes or no. You can yes. Elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I still like that element of it. You know, during the pandemic, I, I miss playing with people. Um, it's, it's a social music. 
and it's a it's a collaborative music you know and that's that's why i was drawn to it and you know that's why i continue to, to play play this music so um that was certainly a you know a, a reason why i got into playing jazz and and these recordings you know all help to support those ideas so without going into the various stories behind the concert that generated the my funny valentine and four and more uh, concerts we'll just hear all of you uh, a night in the life of the Miles Davis Quintet. Again, Miles Davis, George Coleman, trumpet and tenor saxophone, Herbie Hancock piano, um, Ron Carter bass, and Tony Williams drums. It's from February of 64. <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, that was the first 12 minutes of the 15 minute uh, version of All of You, uh, formed by the Miles Davis Quintet in 1964. And uh, the solo by Herbie Hancock, the piano solo, uh, is kind of launched, or is one of the uh, pieces of music that launched Chris Davis into her, uh, I guess, can I use the word obsession? Or, or fascination or immersion in, in, in jazz. Um, what, what, any, what, what can you say about that solo? Uh, uh, what, what are the qualities of it looking back that got you? I mean, I just, I think rhythm and feel, you know, and people like I, after really checking that record out, I would, you know, play for my teachers and they would always say like, oh, you have such a great feel. And I think it goes back to this album, <laughs> just being obsessed with Herbie's playing. Um, mm. Yeah, and there's just, there's so much. I mean, the interaction between uh, Tony Williams and, and Herbie is just so special. Um, and I've always, you know, looked for that connection with drummers as well. And I think it stems back to this record. I mean, just listening to it again, you know, from 20 years later, a lot, a lot of um, my approach in the music, you know, comes from the way these guys played together. Would you, it, uh, would you practice to that, to the rhythm section? Would you play your own variations over it or was it just a silent listening experience? Uh, I mean, I'd play along with the solo. I never improvised mm -hmm. my own um, lines, but I, yeah, I would improvise and try to, or sorry, uh, play the transcription and try to really match Herbie's phrasing. Hmm. Um, so it yeah, got and in then your... the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, so it got in your DNA. I was just, I should have just not said anything. Yeah, and I mean, it, it kind of, my ed, my musical education, you know, came in pieces because I didn't grow up in a musical family. So it was like, I, for whatever reason, I mean, after this, I was checking out Bill Evans and I, I thought, oh, wow, I, I could do that. If you write that out for me, you know, I've got, <laughs> got I can play those lines, you know, it doesn't seem too physically difficult. Little did I know it was all improvised. So I was like, you know, slowly piecing how, how this all, how jazz works. Mm. Um, and then, you know, finding my way. And so when you mentioned the Keith Jarrett record also, that was a, an important one for me to, to transcribe and, and just look at, you know, how lines were constructed. And he also has an amazing feel. So Herbie and Keith were like the two really important pianists for well, me. It started on. off pretty well, I guess. Uh, the, the sonic, the, the sound of this, um, encounter the soundtrack here is going to change a little bit uh, over, over the next hour plus um, and I'd like to talk about but, but th this reflects your listening and reflects um, you know how, how your aesthetic evolved into the music in, into becoming the musician that you are now so just for a little capsule I, I think your high school years were in Calgary Canada and you mentioned right. to me that at yep. a certain point by the end of high school, you were, you had a you had a gig at a restaurant playing standards, uh, and then you went to school in Eastern Canada in Toronto, and continued your education. By the time you got to Toronto as a freshman in school, how would you describe your jazz evolution by that point? And what were some of the things percolating in your mind that were bringing you towards uh, compose to late 20th century composers like Morton Feldman and Ligeti and Cage and uh, uh, then Caro, uh, these people who we're going to hear as, the, as this um, episode progresses. Yeah, I, I didn't have those composers in mind until um... I moved to New York, I think it's in 2001. So when I moved from Calgary to Toronto to go to school, I was still learning standards and trying to, at some point, transition into bebop and learn bebop language. So I spent some time with Bud Powell's music and Charlie Parker and um, so, but still just trying to learn the tradition. And I was playing a lot of gigs, as you mentioned, playing standards, um, doing all sorts of gigs, but you know, mostly mostly standards at restaurants and hotels and things. Um, 
so it wasn't until I went to um, the Banff Center right before I moved to New York in 2001 um, and then made that leap that more classical, uh, contemporary classical composers became um, part of uh, my evolution as, a, as an artist and pianist. Um, and part of that has to do with discovering um, improvised or free music. Um, and there was a, a connection for me. Um, there were questions about using jazz tradition in more free playing, and I felt somewhat limited by um, the structures that I was working with to actually play and engage in free improvised music. Because at that point, free improvised music was again more collective but it was also a um i mean now i'm calling it spontaneously composed music because it's a, it is a collective experience where we're all composing together creating a structure in the moment and so the sort of jazz tradition that i had studied up to that point um just caused some issues like for instance like the, you know the piano is it's a harmonic instrument and the role in traditional jazz is to, to comp to lay out the harmony and support the harmony and um, trying to trying to do that in free improvised music would sometimes control the harmony too much for the other group and so I wanted or for the other players so I wanted to create a space where um, I could still play harmony but it wouldn't lock the other players into a certain harmonic structure um, and so these other composers were going to listen to like Morton Feldman and Nan Caro and John Cage they were all kind of became the answer to those questions. How can I open these these structures up? What what um, contribution did Fel, did Morton Feldman's music, the piece we're about to hear, is pat, pat is a the beginning of a 28 minute uh, piece called which we don't have time for obviously, uh, patterns in a chromatic field. Um, what how did you apply Morton Feldman to your uh, uh, how, how did how, how did he help you find solutions to the uh, issue that you're, describe, that you're describing? Um, well, he, when I heard that piece, you know, the piano has these, uh, it explores the range much more than I had ever heard in uh, more traditional jazz settings. Um, so extreme ranges of the instrument, um, <clears throat> thinking more about uh, intervallic relationships and colors that came from those relationships. Um, so wide open intervals, uh, with maybe some clothes, some real, you know, crunches within those things. And so it, it's, it became more about the, to me, the more about the relationship of the, the shapes than about how it was relating to a bass note and how the bass note was saying the structure is, you know, F7, because it has, you're playing the third and seven and the roots down in the bottom. It was more about the, the harmonic, shapes that Morton Feldman was creating, they could be, they could be anything really. So <laughs> it became more about color and texture um, than I had, you know, thought about in the past. So then when I came to play improvised music, I could take those kinds of intervallic shapes and, and chordal structures, or I don't even want to call them structures, but just shapes and colors. Mm. And it didn't lock anybody into having to play a certain scale or relate to it mm. in any specific way. Okay, um, well, let's hear the first whatever uh, amount of Morton Feldman's Patterns in a Chromatic Field. It's a hat art recording in, uh, from 1981, and it's uh, for cello and piano. <laughs> Thank you. 
first, first nine minutes of uh, Morton Feldman's Patterns in a Chromatic Field, um, had art recorded from 1981. Uh, Chris Davis heard a version on Zadek, which uh, was a preference, but we could not find uh, a, uh, could not find that online. Uh, which, um, so you mentioned that, a, that a, a, a summer residence at Banff, at the Banff Music Workshop in the Canadian Rockies, I guess, uh, um, around year 2000 was a key consciousness switcher for you. Um, talk a little bit about what happened. I know one person you met there was um, the pianist Angelica Sanchez, who you recently recorded actually, um, or who recently recorded a piano duo recording with uh, Marilyn Crispell on your pyroclastic label and with whom you recorded a duo on your, um, uh, uh, on Duopoly, a double CD that you did of duos with six musicians. Uh, talk about, talk a little more about how your, uh, about what that summer did for you and how you uh, then applied it to, um, to your musical progression during the first decade of your, this century. Um, yeah, so I guess it was 2000. Um, I went to the summer jazz workshop, which was run by Kenny Warner at the time. And he invited people like Tony Malaby and Dave Ballou and Ben Monder, Angelica Sanchez, um, Judy Silvano. And uh, they were mostly teaching and playing improvised music in various ways that they do. And so we pretty much for three weeks improvised, completely improvised. And it was totally a new experience for me. And um, I was, you know, confused, like excited and, you know, just all these emotions. Um, about around the music and seeing someone like, you know, Tony Malaby play who's such a great improviser and plays with such intensity and intent. And I couldn't really tell what exactly was going on, but I knew I was drawn to it. And that was the one of the main reasons I wanted to move to New York um, shortly after and uh, explore more about this improvised music and, and how people were engaging in this kind of practice. Um, so I finished up school at University of Toronto and moved down to New York a year later and um, called Tony and said, hey, can I come over and play? And, and uh, I went over and um, Angelica Sanchez and Tony Malaby were together at the time and we'd hang out and talk about music and play and Tony would give us, I'd come with um, some other young musicians and he'd give us really specific instructions on how to think about improvised music and, and then also encouraged me to start composing um, for bringing in compositions to blend with improvisation, exploring that, that side of the music. Had you been composing by that time? Did that start you uh, on your path no. as a composer? Yeah, that kind of started me on, on the path. Um, I was at that time also studying with Jim McNeely, um, studying composition and wanting to get into composition. So it was right around that time, I was about 20, 21, 22, when I really started really digging into composition. What had been your experience with classical music with the European canon before you, you know, before you started playing jazz, uh, maybe during those years, I don't know if you were still studying classical music, but what was your, talk a little about your relationship with the uh, canon. Yeah, it was, you know, pretty standard classical piano repertoire, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, um, and as I mentioned, not growing up in a family of musicians or even really music lovers, I discovered the music mainly through um, reading the scores and understanding the, the language of these composers um, through actually playing at first. And it wasn't until much later that I actually listened to the recordings of other you know, amazing pianists um, play these pieces from the canon. So. Um, that was kind of my experience with classical music. And then right around like 15, 16, when I was in getting into jazz and also studying classical piano, um, I was studying theory and, and harmony, um, tonal harmony. And I started making connections between like, oh, well, you know, this is, you know, this triad and second inversion. And I'm like, 
you know, oh, that's just like, <laughs> you know, like the, the terminology in terms of a chord symbol. And there was like, there was a real disconnect, you know, that was not acceptable that I was making those connections between those two worlds and understanding the music. Um, so it was kind of like piece by piece, but right around that time, then I started um, playing some bar talk and I just, I loved it. It was quirky and it was rhythmic and just something different. And it seemed more connected to the jazz world um, to me in some, maybe I wouldn't explain it at that time in this way, but I think looking back on it, there were more connections in terms of his rhythmic sensibilities that, that I was responding to. And I think my teachers who were very, you know, much about the you know, classical tradition were like, oh, I see you like this music and we don't really want to have anything to do with it, so good luck. And uh, I moved on, I know. <laughs> yes, very strict kind of specific ideas about, you know, what classical music is and isn't. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, um, was Alexander Scriabin part of your listening experience of pre-BAMF or post-BAMF? It was post Banff and um, Angelica Sanchez actually was the person who got me interested in Scriabin. Um, and I just, I heard the music. I didn't learn it first. It was through recording, through this Horowitz uh, recording playing Scriabin that I just fell in love with his music and went on to play many of his etudes. Um, I have an idea. How do you feel about playing this and then the Thelonious Monk track back to back? Sounds good. Sounds good, okay. This is uh, uh, Vladimir Horowitz's um, version of Alexander Scriabin's Preludes Opus 11, number three in G, 46 second uh, track. <laughs> and then Thelonious Monk trio with uh, Art Blakey on drums in 1952 on a very different kind of actual piano instrument uh, playing his uh, wonderful classic Monk stream. So Horowitz first stable.
Thelonious Monk propelled by Art Blakey bases the scary map, uh, Monk's Dream from 1952, uh, recorded for Prestige Records. Before that, we heard Vladimir Horowitz playing Alexander Skriabin's uh, Prelude Opus 11, number three in G. A lot of music. <laughs> We've been hearing a lot of music so far, and there's much more to go. Um, how did how did, did what how, how did Monk come into your universe? Um, Monk came into my universe kind of late, maybe a couple years into being in New York, um, and it came to me through scores, actually, through reading his tunes and learning his compositions and improvising. Um, on them with others and then kind of like went back to the recordings and discovered you know really discovered monk um and his you know his sound and his approach to improvisation and um and rhythm and um so yeah it's funny it's funny how these how people come into your life right how their musical worlds enter in it's not always through uh through sound necessarily or through you know recordings but um sometimes passing on through other musicians and um you, I, I i believe uh i just saw a clip of you and fred hirsch playing um there's a video a video clip of you and he piano duetting on a monk tune and i can't i can't remember which one it is now and, yeah it was mysterioso uh mysterioso and you recorded uh Aronel, which uh is I, I don't want to go into the whole thing about attribution, but it's a, it's, it's a composition associated with Monk and Sadiq Hakim, and you recorded that in duo with Billy Drummond in, um, on your Duopoly record. And I gave that to a pianist on a blindfold test a few years ago, wow. and, he, and he guessed it was you, and, okay. he, and he praised you highly, and he, he said what he liked about it was that you played Monk without resorting to what he called Monkisms, that is to say, dealing with the traffic, not the trappings, but the, but his stylistic idiosyncrasies and instead really applied your personality to it. And I'm, I'm wondering how much Monk you've played and performed and if you can extrapolate that praiseful comment into something about your aesthetic, about playing, I don't know, standards, quote unquote, or just playing in general. Yeah, well, it really, you know, it's a tribute to the genius of Monk. I mean, his pieces are these little perfectly crafted gems and they're always, they're fairly simple in a way, you know, and, and because they're simple, they're strong. He's got this very um, unique approach to rhythm and form, which um, just seemed to work well with my desire to want to pull that apart. And so the strength is in the composition and in the ideas and so when you extrapolate from that, you know, the, the rhythm and, and language is always there, but you can bring your own, um, your own approach to, to the language and the ideas. Um, so Monk has always, you know, been that person for me and his compositions. Um, I think that's why they continue to live on for so many composers and improvisers, um, cause it's just, it's endless. Um, and it, it, in a little bit, we'll listen to, um, some of Ligeti's etudes and it, to me there's a real connection there in compositional approach because they're both dealing with these very simple specific ideas and then extrapolating and expanding in different ways one is improvising and one is composing um but it's always about like you know bringing it down to this very specific seed of the piece and then building out from there so before we get to Ligeti, though, uh, we're going to hear two selections back to back, uh, both of which uh, that are connected by the presence of Paul Blay on, on piano. Uh, the first is from Jimmy Jufri's great trio with Paul Blay and Steve Swallow from some recordings that were unearthed a number of years ago on ECM on the double CD called 1961. And the piece is called Whirr, W-H-I-R-R, -R, like Whirr, and uh, excuse me, Chris, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the other is a trio by Blay with uh, Kent Carter and uh, Barry Altschul from 1965. A few words about the first thing we'll hear, though, the Jimmy Jufri trio. And uh, uh, again, you know, you know the drill by now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. My, I don't know how to turn the... Uh... Zoom like phone call thing off my computer. 
computer. Anyway, um, so yeah, the, the Jimmy Jufri uh, trio I discovered right around, yeah, a couple of years into New York and, and uh, playing more improvised music and blending composition and improvisation. And I can't remember who introduced or who told me about Jimmy Jufri, but when I, um, when I heard that recording, I mean, I was hearing connections of contemporary classical music with Jimmy Jufri's language and the, the way that the three, like Steve Swallow and Paul Blay and Jimmy Jufri improvised together. Once the head is done, they're also extrapolating as Monk did from, from the ideas. Um, but there's no sense of, you know, like pre-planned solos. So they're really feeling it out together in terms of who's being in the foreground, who's in the background, who's, who's taking a supportive role. Um, and that, that dynamic is fluid. And so this was the first time I'd heard that kind of dynamic and it really it inspired me to want to explore that in my own music. All right, hey, well, let's let's hear "Were" and then go directly into a "Start" by the Paul Blay Trio, and Chris will talk about that once it's done. <laughs> Thank you. 
out a 12-way solo on, um, uh, on a piece called Start from the album Touching, a trio documenting, uh, an album documenting his trio in the mid-60s with bassist Kent Carter and drummer Barry Alchel. Um, before that, we heard play as part of the Jimmy Jufri trio, Steve Swallow and Jimmy Jufri on clarinet on a piece called Whirr. Uh, W-H-I-R-R -R from some sessions in 1961. You can hear that on ECM. A few words about Paul Belay, uh, Chris Davis. Yeah, um, well, it's funny when you asked me, you know, to do this, this desert island recording um, reflection, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I had to include something by Paul Belay. And then going back to this record, I kind of almost forgot how much of an impact he had <laughs> On me and I was like, wow, I, I, I took a lot from Paul Blay. So, um, I don't know, just the, the phrasing, the, the space, the sort of, you know, paint gestures that he has when he plays, um, that are very unique to him. It just spoke to me. And I also love that. I mean, I wanted to include this as well, but his solo on all the things you are from the sunny meets Hawk recording which you know i often play for my students because they're often looking to figure out how to connect improvised music and standards and that's such a great kind of entry point to hear you know paul blay he just follows the the line the shape the direction of his of his ideas and sometimes they fit with the chord sometimes they don't sometimes they fit with the rhythm sometimes they don't mm. but it's so strong um and you know you can kind of hear this like stemming from those ideas and fully fully formed um paul blaze it's such it brought such a um solid foundation in the music to his explorations in the 60s this is the guy who played with charlie parker when he was 50, when he was about 20 years old he played with Lester young as he describes in his autobiography played with ornette coleman he played with sonny rollins and he um and many other people and he really set uh, set the stage for the developments you're talking about. Quick question, Chris. You, you've talked uh, in, a, one, in a couple of uh, your uh, remarks so far, you've talked about designs and paint and you know gestures and visualness. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of visualization in the way you think about improvising and creating music. Yeah, it's a really important part of the music for me. And I remember like when I was a kid, they, you did this test, you did these tests where you were like, are you an oral person or a visual person or a sensory person? Yeah. <laughs> and I was so into music at the time. I was like, I'm definitely an oral person. You know, I, that's how I learn. And I realized, you know, I realized 
shortly after I'm not, I'm totally a visual learner. Um, and not to say I'm not the other learners, but, um, but I certainly lead with visualization. So it's become an important, um, it is an important part of the way that I take in uh, information and, and how the music comes out. Um, yeah, I don't know if that <laughs> No, it's that's that, that, no, that, it, it's it's your answer to the question. <laughs> that's just that's just what it is. Uh, another question. I I just was talking about Blaise's background, and you know, for lack of uh, this is intellectually lazy, but I'm going to call it the tradition. And I'm wondering for you, as someone who was immersed in more you know orthodox, not orthodox, but in in in, in the uh, pre '60s forms of jazz or you know, um, as a young musician, do you feel that that's had a salutary effect on what you've done since? In other words, you know, you, you, were, you were 20, 21 years old when you started uh, move, move, moving in other directions. Uh, was, was, what, what impact do you think that has on the way you conceptualized, you've subsequently conceptualized things up to, up to now? Um, well, I think it, contributed to the foundation so you know things like um like having a good time feel or feeling time in a certain way or thinking about um the way that form is dealt with and then either rejecting that or accepting it or both but you know, at least confronting it so i don't know it's just all along the way you're you're um you're picking up these things and they become part of you and then some of them fall off, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and it's, it's kind of a mystery. <laughs> so, I mean, now, you know, I, I've kind of gone full circle where I'm back to, I mean, I think I've mentioned to you before, like I stopped writing chord symbols like 20 years ago. And then I just would always write harmonic structures with the notes if I needed to explain harmony. Cause I, I felt like, and I still feel that when you see a chord symbol, you react to it in a certain way um, instead of uh, maybe considering what's actually, you know, happening in terms of the, the big picture of the music. Um, but now I've, I've kind of gone full circle. I'm back to writing some chord symbols and tunes because um, I want to relate to the harmony in that way. So, you know, but if, if I hadn't studied that at some point and it hadn't been part of my, you know, musical experience, then I, I wouldn't be able to do it. Obviously, I'd relate to it and bring that to the music in a, in a way that's, you know, kind of authentic and, and connected to tradition. So up to now, you've um, played for us uh, completely individualistic, instantly recognizable uh, you know, language builders, so, so musicians, none more so than Kamlan Nankaral uh, and his player piano work. Uh, just a few words about I mean, it's If you've never heard Nankaral, you're, you know, you'll, I, 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 I sort of envy you the experience, but, uh, but, but, but for you, um, Talk a little bit about Nan Carrow and his impact on you. Yeah, I first um, heard about Nan Carrow uh, actually at the main jazz camp I was teaching up there and Dave Allen was there one year and he said, oh, have you heard Nan Carrow? Like you, you really sound like you've checked him out. I was like, no, I haven't heard him. <laughs> I couldn't listen. So I went home and just became obsessed with his player piano recordings and, and pieces. And um, one of the things that struck me and I still think about it and teach it as the idea of um, polytempo. So, um, you know, we think about polyrhythms where we're dealing with a certain amount of beats within another amount of beats, like five over four. And, but it always comes out in the wash on the next bar. We're always back to, you know, lining up on beat one. Um, and polytempo is, is kind of a, you know, just a, a broader idea of, of polyrhythm where we would have one faster tempo over a slower tempo or vice versa. And this track we're going to listen to um, really illustrates that kind of idea of polytempo, which is something I use in my music and improvisation all the time. You feel okay about playing this and the Ligeti track back to back? Sure. Okay, let's play them back to back, Abel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jorge Ligeti, um, uh, as you can see if you're reading the screen, but I'll say it anyway, uh, Toots for Piano Four Fanfares, the pianist is Pierre Laurent on Mars, excuse my pronunciation. Um, for that, we heard Conlon Nancarel's uh, Hyper Boogie Woogie, maybe I could call it, uh, study number 3A from the Studies for Player Piano uh, on the 1750 Arts label. And now that I know there's a CD with all four volumes, I'm going to get it. <laughs> um, thanks, Chris. So uh, just a few words about what we heard. I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> no, now you're good. <laughs> Um, let's see. Well, okay, one thing I wanted to mention, Pierre Laurent Amard, also apologize for my pronunciation. And you're, but one of, yeah, you're Canadian, you're supposed to be able to. No, no. I know, I know, everyone says that, but my from the West and we uh, butcher, butcher French, so sometimes. Uh, um, yeah, but if you're, um, he's one of my most favorite, favorite classical pianists, and he has this really cool website um, called explorethescore.org, and he plays uh, Ligeti's music, and you can see the score, and he does little workshops on like sections of the piece, and it's super cool. So if anybody's looking for, uh, you know, some ideas. <laughs> You've mentioned Ligeti early, earlier in, in relation to Monk, I think, uh, talking about a kind of parallel in the simplicity of the structures and the rhythmic component of it. I think he's, that's what you said, if I heard you correctly before. Yeah, that, you know, that, I mean, in all of those etudes, it's very clear what the piece is about from like the first couple beats. Um, and so this one with that little running line, which is actually one of Messian's modes, of limited transposition. Um, it's moving, you know, just constantly. And then there's these uh, melodic languages, these kind of dyads um, in connection to that. And then it flips. So it's always then the right hand playing the line and the left hand's moving the dyads and it keeps flipping back and forth. Um, so yeah, that was just, that was the first uh, Ligeti etude I, I learned and you know, they're all really hard. I can pretty much, I can get through like three quarters of the piece and then I give up. So I know, I know I could probably play like five or six of them, but yeah, it's, by the end, it's pretty tough. How many etudes are there? Oh, uh, that's a good question. There's two books, I think there's 18. 18. How much practicing do you get to do these days anyway with all the different <laughs> obligations uh -oh. that you have? Wrong <laughs> uh, uh, questions, sorry. No, 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 I'm, I'm getting to it. Um, you know, with the pandemic, uh, I certainly had more time to practice, um, but I just try to book it into my day as best I can. And I also try to practice with my students now. And so, no, I would say I practice every day, every second day for a couple of hours. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, coming up is a uh, one aspect of your um, musicianship, a tonal personality is in incorporating prepared piano into the, uh, into the free improvised space and also into your compositions. You're certainly not the only person who does this, but you do it in a very distinctive way. Uh, you, I know you studied with Benoit Del Beck, uh, who's a specialist in that, as well as other things, and you've recorded him as well, one of the more recent pyroclastic recordings, and, and, and other, others as well. Talk a little bit about the um, appeal of prepared piano and how that, uh, I don't want to use the word augments, that might not be the right word, but where it fits into the totality of what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Benoit, I met, well, actually, he was the first that was the first time I had heard prepared piano was, was Benoit's solo record um, called New Turn. And so then like a year later, I went to Paris to study with him. And um, the first thing he actually pulled up was that Ligeti piece, Fanfares, which I had already been working on for like a year. So I was like, oh, we're instantly connected. You know, I'm on the right track here. Um, and uh yeah, so he kind of introduced me to some of his ideas around piano preparation, and he makes um, all sorts of materials and ways of, you know, fitting them in the strings to alter the sound of the instrument in some way, which makes it very percussive. Um, and so then, you know, after studying with him in Paris, came home to, 
to do some more learning about prepared piano and you know John Cage is the master of prepared piano and, and I kind of went deep into his music for um, for a moment there so um, this recording we're going to listen to um, is just like one of my favorite uh, well the whole album of course John Cage prepared piano um, pieces um, and the thing that struck struck me about his way of using uh, preparations. I mean, it's, it's so rhythmic and there's still pitch material. And so there's, I would say he, he really influenced um, my own um, usage of prepared piano and improvised music and composition uh, more so than anyone else. And this is a, a good track to show, I think. I love the title, uh, The Earth Shall Bear Again. What a great title John Cage applied to that. Now, do, do, do you know what, um, what um, he was using to prepare the piano, what he was applying to the, to the strings? Are, are you, is your ear, can, can you pinpoint that sort of thing at this point? Some things, I mean, he, he used um, some weather stripping. That was a common uh, material and then some screws like up high and you hear that you know kind of buzzing but also like resonant sound um, and then some wood I think he was using some clothespins um, as well yeah those are those are the ones I can pick out that's a funky track right <laughs> very funky very funky <laughs> 
and, uh, and, and, and how did you have your own uh, um, preferences for materials to modify, you know, the, to modify the piano strings that create sound? Uh, talk a little bit about your own approach. Um, yeah, I just, you know, went to the hardware store. <laughs> oh, <you laughs> took a trip to the hardware store? Okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah, and I found some, I, I like the clothespins. Um, I take them apart and, um, you know, if you just put them in, they sometimes pop out when you're playing, but I like the sound when you kind of tuck them under the string and they're resting on the soundboard and it gives that clack kind of sound, but also <coughs> you still hear a pitch. Um, and I use erasers, like the end of erasers and gummies sometimes. You get different harmonics. Um, I like to use gaffer's tape, um, which I saw Sylvie Corvassier use a long time ago. Um, and that's a quick move, you know, of just getting the tape on the strings. And again, we still hear the pitch, but it's dampened. And, and when you put, depress the, the sustain pedal, we also get like the dampened and resonant sound, which is cool. So it's just a sort of exploration of, of what's possible. And, you know, I, I try to encourage if my students are interested in also incorporating um, piano preparations to find their own materials because everyone who, who does it, you know, has their, has their own way. Yeah. Well, speaking of expanding the range of the piano, the uh, next artist and the penultimate one for our session with Chris Davis is Cecil Taylor, who uh, developed, developed his own amazing technique and, uh, and approach, and I'm gonna let Chris talk about Cecil. Uh, we, we, we're not gonna be able to play the full 18 minute track, but we'll get a nice taste of a piece uh, called Abyss from a 1974 concert called Silent Talk that came out uh, at the Montreux Jazz Festival in 74 that came out originally on Arista Records. Cecil Taylor, um, how did he enter your universe, Chris? Yeah, I mean, just to, to connect that last track and this one, as I was, I was listening, um, Cage also has these very kind of segmented cells of ideas that move into something fairly different, um, contain these contained ideas. And Cecil Taylor is also a person, you know, to me who, who works in this way. Um, and I, uh, you know, I got into Cecil um, early on checking out like unit structures and conquistador these records um and then i was talking to eric Rivas, and he said oh do you know this album silent tongues it was just a couple years ago this um solo concert and uh i just kind of fell in love with it you know there's you just hear you can hear him it's almost like visceral the way he connects with the sound and then it also shows like the whole if you listen to the whole record you hear the the cells of each idea of the piece and he's extrapolating and and um, expanding upon you know each of the ideas and it kind of it made me realize like how how much of his work is actually um, already pre uh, written not written out but pre uh, what's the word um, <laughs> preconceived preconceived pre exactly uh, yeah preconceived exactly created a space a, a preset space within which freedom imagination can roam or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So there's room for improvisation in terms of, um, uh, you know, touch and dynamics and uh, articulation, all those things. And then of course the ideas, but the, the ideas, yeah, they're already kind of like, they're set there for him to, to play. I, I, we talk, I, I mentioned this briefly in relation to, uh, to your approach to Monk and you know, there's some, you know, particularly in more recent things. I was I was looking uh, in preparation for this at a video on YouTube where you're playing with William Parker and Jeff Watts, and there are certain, you know, Cecil Taylorish moments in that. And yet again, you don't really play his vocabulary. It's more the attitude and the thought process that you somehow refract into your own ideas in a certain way. I don't know. Can, 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 and, and since we're approaching the end of our session, can you maybe talk a little summationally about how all these different influences and you know rugged individualists, all of them, uh, 
blend into you. Maybe it's just a mystery and you can't, but maybe you can. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can. I mean, Cecil, you know, there, there's like a little something from everybody that I think has, you know, seeped its way into my playing and, and artistic practice. And, uh, and Cecil, one of the things I love that he does, I mean, he's, he's so melodic and so rhythmic. And then there's moments where he's just completely abandons everything. And it's just pure raw yeah. emotion, you know, yeah. just like physicality, like connecting to the instrument, which I love. And I, you know, I wish, I wish I could do that, <laughs> you know, be that physical with the instrument. Um, but I still aspire to like, those moments, you know, and I feel them when they come up, it's like they're bubbling up and then it's like, this feels like the right, the right thing. And that, that really comes from Cecil and hearing him. Are you, uh, you, you were talking, we've talked a couple of times about uh, your relationship, about the relationship between sound and design and, uh, and visualization. The, the, are you involved, are you, does the dance enter into it? I'm thinking of Cecil's relationship with ballet and modern dance. He, he once did a collaboration with Barishnikov actually. Uh, oh, wow. a, a long time ago, and, I, and when I hear Cecil in full flight, I think of you know, I you know some master dancer from the Alvin Ailey Company or something like this. Do, uh, is is dance something that's important to you? Not really. I mean, I don't. I don't dance. I mean, I can like move in my chair. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Dancing in your head, Ornette Coleman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's one of my favorite records. I should have darn. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, anyway, we can. I'll think about that question. and get back to you. <laughs> Maybe so. Let's let's hear the the first section of Abyss, which is the opening uh, section of Silent Tongues. Which, by the way, I think there may be a video of this on YouTube. I've seen it before. Unless it's been taken down, you can probably you may be able to see this. Anyway, um, let's um, hear the first seven or so minutes of uh, Silent Tongues. Taylor.
that's the um, that's the, the transition from uh, the section called abyss into the uh, final two sections called uh, crossings. I think Cecil may have been thinking of the middle passage when he titled when he titled those, but it just occurred to me yesterday. But I don't know. Anyway, um, Chris Davis. Thank you very much for participating in this exercise of uh, Desert Island Discs. And um, I don't know if, uh, if these would literally be the pieces of music you'd want on the Desert Island if you only had, had, had 12. But um, one thing I bet you'd want on the Desert Island is something to groove to or to put you in a sort of different mood. And maybe that's what we can, uh, that, that's the context in which we can address this final selection of yours by Michelle and, and Begay Ocello. A um, few words about that. You would, he would also mention Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life as an album, and I you, you didn't specify any particular tracks off of that. But uh, tell us about, about this track and about your relationship with her music. Um, yeah, I... I first uh, heard this album when I was 15 and, you know, growing up in Canada and the fairly sheltered town of Calgary, <laughs> hearing this album was just like mind blowing. You know, she just completely puts it out there um, in every way, musically, um, the messages she's, she's talking about. I just, um, I'm still to this day, like just in awe of her ability to you know, put it all out there. It's that she's such a, a strong individual and, and force. Um, yeah, so this is just one of the tracks, but I, this was like the album I listened to in the car, you know, <laughs> driving everywhere. And it's kind of the soundtrack of my childhood um, or my, my youth. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to, wanted to include it. Chris Davis, thanks so much for, uh... It's a fascinating program and uh, sh showing the interrelationships between this cohort of composers and uh, an incredible pianist. I mean, what an, what an education in both the art of playing piano and the art of composition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. This has been really fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun for me, too. Uh, the Michelle, the Michelle and Degay show a track as I'm digging you like an old soul record. And I'm Ted Pankin, and uh, when this is done, that will be the end of this edition of Desert Island Discs for the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Sit back, relax, and listen to the H.I. I dig it like an old soul right here. Sit back, relax, and listen to the A-Track. I dig it like I know.